Okay, hello again. Ready for another video here in 2022 when I'm making these videos. Uh, often a little bit late to the party. I'm just now today recovering from COVID-19. So, uh, yeah, yeah, not fun, but uh, not too bad for me. It was a week of unpleasantness and uh, I'm starting to come out of it a bit. But uh, no fun being sick. And I'll try to tie that in to this chapter seven lecture toward the end. Okay, so um, we're talking about species interactions, ecological, uh, ecological succession, and population control. And largely we'll be talking about what would ideally be going on in nature. And uh, we're also going to be talking about how we've interrupted uh, these, these interactions and, and these progressions. Okay, so we'll start off uh, talking about a predator speech species here, more on the species interactions coming up. But this is the southern sea otter. They have them out there in uh, the Pacific Northwest. And on the right, you can see these big plant forms in the water. These are kelp forests, and these are like the rainforests of the, uh, of the water out there. But there's just so much biological diversity to them. And uh, so a lot of habitat and a lot of um, food sources for a lot of different species. So a lot of biodiversity there, an important ecosystem. Also close to the coast there. So when they're strong, they slow down the currents and uh, storm and flooding damage is a little bit less because of them if they're intact. And um, we're jeopardizing them by messing around with that species interaction there. Our cute friend, the otter there, feeds on the sea urchin. <clears throat> and the sea urchin uh, is a species that eats the kelp at large rates, not leaving enough for the other species, unless the otter can keep them in check. And uh, they do, but we hunted the otter, and uh, now we've kind of turned around where we're not doing that as much. And um, so they are a nice recovery there. They were close to extinction but that's a nice recovery there for the, uh, for the honors. So, uh, yeah, we're also jeopardizing uh, the, uh, the kelp forest there with pollution and, uh, and other things that we're doing. So there, there's the idea of the otter, and, and uh, we'll kind of think about that as we talk about these other species interactions. We're familiar with these species interactions largely, uh, but we'll talk about them in a little bit more depth here and come up with some definitions. So competition, that makes sense. Species react uh, in uh, competition. They go for the resources that are out there. And sometimes these resources are limited and they gotta, gotta fight for them. So competition is one thing that uh, we're very familiar with here uh, in all kinds of species. Uh, predation is another one where one species uh, preys on another one. Um, we're familiar with those as well. Parasites. Parasites uh, generally take over their hosts. We'll talk about um, more all of these in more detail here, including mutualism and commensalism. So we'll go into each one of these uh, individually, but uh, this is where we're headed. All right, so competition for resources. This is the one we're probably most familiar with or is intuitively there for us. Interspecific competition is going to be where you are um, competing between different species for the same thing. So maybe two prey species or two predator species uh, prey on the same uh, prey species. And so they would be in competition for them. Um, plants for sunlight is a possibility. And uh, there are things that uh, happen here naturally uh, to, uh, to compensate for these things. And one of them is resource partitioning. This is a very clever thing that happens. All right, maybe we can't outcompete you, so we're going to go to some place that uh, might be a little less desirable to you if you're the more dominating species. Or um, we find out if we're you know, separating the same resource, but we use it at different times of day. And uh, in some kind of, not looking to cooperate with each other, but looking to preserve themselves, species will do some very interesting things with these ideas of uh, resource partitioning. Okay, so here's a, an example of that. These were warblers who originally were one species, and eventually, because of this uh, adaptation, they adapted into different species. Mm, pretty interesting. So the... Um, um, idea here, and it's pretty obvious from the diagram there, is that uh, each one of these adapted to different parts of the same tree. 
So they all have similarities, but they spend time in different parts of the tree. That's pretty clever. Clever uh, must have been interesting to find that out for the first time, that animal behavior, you know. All right, so here's another one um, where, you know, it might be the same plant uh, or the same um, thing here. Here's, here's are the um, uh, different kind of beaks that have evolved. So, you know, you can picture this through what we've talked about through natural selection. So some members of the species got these beaks and, and they grew a little bit different so they could access different parts of the plants or get a little bit deeper into the wood if it was or or whatever it is. And, um, and then eventually they can evolve into a different species as that becomes an advantage. Some of the, the resource partitioning leads to these things. All right, predation, again, we're very familiar with. The coyote's always chasing the roadrunner, right? And uh, there's other things that that coyote does. And, uh, you know, if you remember those cartoons, if not, look them up. Uh, they're, they're a good uh, example of predation in the cartoon world. But these are all things that uh, Wiley Coyote tried to use on the Roadrunner, and other species do uh, as well. They'll chase them, they'll swim after them, fly after them, walk after them. Camouflage, so you don't even know they're there. Chemical warfare, like spiders, will put a little ven ven venom in you to slow you down and then, uh, then save you for later. Prey species also have done this, right? They've come up with things that they're going to use and similar, right? Kind of camouflage, you can't see me, some kind of coloration. Sometimes these, a um, uh, good example, I think we've got a picture of it coming up here, is, uh, yeah, these, these butterflies here. So if you look at D and F there, there's the monarch and the viceroy butterfly. So the monarch uh, tastes bad. And the species realize after a while, hey, um, that's chemical warfare. I don't want to eat them. They're easy prey, but, uh, but I don't want to eat them because they're going to taste bad and, and, and might make me sick even. Now, the viceroy butterfly looks like the monarch, but it's not foul tasting. But it uses that, uh, that coloration as a, as a way of warding off uh, the thing. And that's mimicry. Mimicry is what you'd have to call that. All right, so these are things that they do to uh, keep from being eaten, right? That's a good thing. And because of this, and this makes sense, uh, I would imagine, is, um, um, oh, yeah, getting back to the warning coloration and all that and the mimicry and that fun stuff. But um, I heard a, a, a phrase that makes sense regarding this. But out in nature, if it's really beautiful to look at, they say it's probably... Um, probably not good to eat. <laughs> and if it's really, really, really beautiful, it's uh, probably poisonous. <laughs> you know, they can get away with it. If they have all these colors, you know, it'd be easy for the predator to see them. But maybe that's the point I want you to see. And you know that I'd be poisonous uh, to you. All right, so here's a bear eating a salmon, a fish out in the water. That's a predator-prey relationship. So that's a pretty, pretty well-known one. And uh, here again, here are some of the things that animals do here. The span worm, oh man, we should, we should uh, look these up in class or you should look them up. These things are amazing. They're like caterpillars and all of a sudden they look like snakes. And uh, nature's come up with some, some amazing things. Uh, the butterfly there in G, right? It, makes, uh, it has a, uh, um, uh, the uh, idea that it looks like giant eyes, you know. And there, there's the snake caterpillar. That's the one you should really look at, the snake caterpillar. Pretty, pretty impressive. All right, bombardier beetle has a gas that it uses. And... All right, so that's the idea. And the coevolution makes some sense from what we've talked about with evolution before. And this is the predator. You know, the predator goes after the easiest of the prey. And uh, so that helps weed out the ones that are, are weaker, maybe less adaptable. And that means you have a stronger gene pool. So, uh, so that's the deal there. And also the ones that are able to maybe elude capture in some way, whether it's uh, better coloration or a better camouflage, or they can run faster, um, you know, they'll be able to pass on those traits. And so the prey species becomes a little bit faster. It's not that the predator is teaching them to run faster, but through natural selection, the ones that can run faster have an advantage. And the same is true with the prey. You know, prey species that uh, can't catch the, uh, you know, predator species that can't catch the prey, that's not going to do you any good, right? So the prey gets uh, stronger in some ways, and the predators get stronger as well. They evolve together. Parasites don't usually kill their hosts. They're going to live off them for a while. So um, 
So here's a here's a fish that does not like having that parasite on it. And um, but yeah, generally they'll just make you sicker and uh, drain the health from you. But they don't want to kill their hosts generally. You know, they want to live on them for a while. Usually they're smaller than their hosts because of that. And that's the idea of parasites, the way different species react. All right. Mutualism is where they both benefit. So <laughs> this is a great picture, I think, right? There is a hooved animal with some birds that will eat the insects off of it. And so they both benefit. So it seems like they have a nice relationship there. Um, although each species, as uh, the naturalists will point out, is really out for its own benefit. And in this case, both species uh, do benefit. Um, commensal commensalism is where one of the species is going to benefit, where the other one uh, um, doesn't seem to be affected one way or the other. So here's plants that grow around trees, I guess, is what we got going on here. And that becomes a, um, something that's good for the plant but doesn't harm the tree in any way. And, uh, and there's all kinds of uh, relationships like this with commensalism as well. One species benefits and the other does not, but doesn't seem to mind. All right, so how about the changes in these conditions that go on? And now again, we're gonna start thinking in terms of what anthropogenical uh, sources of these changes, uh, anthropological choices have been coming in, people driven. All right, so ecological succession is something that happens naturally anyway. You know, sometimes you have to restart. Maybe there'll be a volcano or something like that, and you'll be back to ground one. Um, but ecological succession usually um, has to start out with primary succession. And that's where you get your soil. We've talked about it already. You know, without the plants, we don't really have any uh, future. Um, every food chain has got to have these producers. So on land, primary ecological uh, succession is going to involve the formation of soil, which involves moss and, and lichens. These are the first species that have to come in in order for that soil to form. And uh, it's not a very quick process, um, but it's certainly, uh, certainly an important one. And like I said, without it, none of the other steps are, are going to be able to happen. So that's the idea there. And um, in aquatic systems, you, there would be sediments that have to form. And, uh, and there you go. All right, in secondary ecological solution, maybe there's some kind of disturbance and you're not starting from scratch. You have soil. I always think of uh, the old ball field. So, um, I, you know, I've been places where there was a baseball field and then the baseball field was... Uh, was, uh, you know, not taken care of, and it was pretty quick where the plants grow back over it. That would be the secondary eco um, ecological solution. So farmland that's done, maybe a territory that's burned, the soil isn't completely gone, but all the plants are, so I got to start over again, but not from scratch. All right, so that'll be the deal there. Okay, and there are a lot of things that will affect the rate of this, of how fast these things are going to happen. And um, that's, the you know, if there are species there to lay the groundwork, are there plant species there to get you started? And, um, there, and are there things that are getting in the way of that growth there too, things that will inhibit them? All right, so here are some pictures that will explain that uh, idea. You know, you have the exposed rock, so then you have to go through the primary succession and eventually you get these further developed forests uh, that we look at. In New Jersey, these are secondary forests. These are secondary succession because the forests that we look at around our school, the, the trees in the park um, that we look at, the woods that we see, um, that was all cleared and grew back again. So that, that's from secondary succession. And uh, we don't always think of it like that. But uh, we're pretty far along there. So, you know, even though we cut it down, a couple, of, a couple hundred years, and, and you could be back in business. Here's an idea of the sediments that build up in the lake and uh, the succession that would happen there. So it's the same, same kind of concept there. Um, and there you are. And um, again, here's a little bit of an idea of over time what kind of forest you're going to look at, depending on the areas that you're at, of course. And uh, there used to be an idea here that, you know, there would become a balance. So you get to a point where things would pretty much stay the same. But uh, we're doing more and more work with these, uh, um, you know, we're discovering things all the time involved with nature and all kinds of uh, parts of science. Very, 
exciting times that we're living in. And now they're saying that succession becomes more and more complex as it goes. So there's, um, you know, it's going to be more and more diverse and more resilient. And we'll talk about resilient in a little bit here too, because there is constant change that's going on. So inertia is um, the ability of a system, a setup, an ecosystem to survive a moderate disturbance. There's no problem. Um, it can survive it. You know, it takes a couple shots, but, uh, but it can survive it. And that would be the idea of inertia. And resilience, that we just were talking about there, is whether you can come back from secondary succession. So getting wiped out and having the resilience to build back up again. We've already talked about tipping points. So as we are putting these systems through uh, change, that's one of the things that we have to think about. Is there a tipping point where there's no resilience remaining? So we tie that in from the other chapters. All right, so what are the things that are going to limit the uh, growth of the population, right? One thing is the distribution. Where is the population at? Is there a population that's uh, very clustered together? Then it's got a big chance of uh, growing. If the population distribution is low, it's got a lower, a lower uh, chance of doing that. All right, so the variables where you would talk about the growth of a population or the shrinking of a population are pretty obvious, right? Births and deaths, immigration and emigration. So you would add the births and immigration together and subtract off the deaths and the emigration. You know, emigration or people leaving a country or leaving an area. And that's how you would talk about the, the growth of a population or the, the shrinking of a population as well. And of course, scientists are paying attention to this as we are realizing that we are affecting mostly the shrinking of other populations in so many different ways. All right, another is the age structure of the population. If they're all past reproductive age, then, uh, you know, if the majority of your population is past the reproductive age, you've got a shrinking population. That should make some sense. And if the, you know, if you have post, you know, pre-reproductive or just entering reproductive age, if that's where the majority of your population is, you're about to have a growth spurt. All right, so here are some of the distribution patterns, things that uh, can limit the growth or the survival of a species. So here's some elephants, and they're living in a, a clumped population. And, uh, you know, so they're uh, living together. And then there are these uh, plants that grow uniformly, and then their randomness of the, of, the, of the dandelions. So these are different things that the species will do um, to you know, maybe maximize their, the benefits uh, of what they're, uh, if they can. So clumped is a good thing. You know, if you're clumped, you might have more uh, resistant to predators if you're a prey species. Um, you might also have a better, you know, idea or better chance of reproduction if you're in a clumped area. Uniform there is probably advantageous because of the use of the resources. So, you know, if they grew any bit bigger, they might be blocking each other out for the uh, sunlight. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but there has to be some advantage to that. All right, so here are some things that can limit your population um, uh, growth or the population size. One of the things is the range of tolerance. So this is for a fish species, and the idea is a temperature range of tolerance. You know, if the temperatures are too high, then, uh, you know, they can't survive at all. And if they're too low, they can't survive either. So that could affect what's going on. And on the other side, if you're at the optimum range, you're going to have the maximum um, uh, growth there. This is a good idea to talk about genetic diversity within a species, to remind ourselves of that. It's important that you have some of these outliers. If the temperature drastically drops, you know, a good percentage of your population maybe can't handle it, but the species will go on because they'll be able to pass on those traits. And the same at the higher ends, right? All right, so populations grow in different ways, and, um, you know, so we'll be aware of these things. And, um, you know, so the idea is, you know, eventually the stuff is going to wear out. You can't keep growing indefinitely. The human species has slowed down its rate of growth, but it is still growing exponentially, and other species do that as well. So you come up with what's called a J-curve here, and the idea is that it's going up, 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 up. 
And that's been the limitations of many species here. So what happens generally is you can go through this exp exponential growth and this could happen very quickly for some species, right? For some species like uh, maybe mosquitoes or some kind of insects or bacteria, as long as the resources are there, you'll get this big boom going up. For bigger species, you know, more mammals and that type of thing, it's a little tougher to get that momentum going because uh, they breed so much later in life. Now, humans aren't having that problem, but uh, certainly other species are. But once, but even with these species that we'll later call our selected species, or we'll call our selected now and remind ourselves later, even those species are going to hit limiting factors. There'll only be only so much that they can grow, and that's where you get to the carrying capacity or the optimum carrying capacity uh, for an ecosystem. And if you overshoot it, you're bound to hit this uh, dieback. So, uh, yeah, this is a famous study here for reindeer over the year. And they all of a sudden had all the stuff. And then the populations crashed back again. We don't deal with reindeer here. We deal with regular deer. And we'll talk more about them a little bit later, too, uh, in population growth. All right, so there are reproductive pa uh, patterns, as I mentioned before. So there's our selected species. These are species that generally don't have very many offspring when they uh, do have many, lots and lots of offspring when they reproduce, and they reproduce quickly, and uh, they regenerate very quickly too. So these are usually smaller species, and um, because they're able to do this so quickly with the reproduction, they might have kind of an irregular pattern in their reproduction, depending on when resources are available and when the diebacks come. And case-selected species, as I mentioned before, are where I was talking about before, are generally mammals, bigger species, and they reproduce later in life. Uh, they have fewer offspring, and uh, they live for a long time. And because of this, as I've also mentioned, uh, humans don't seem to be as susceptible to it yet, but uh, other species um, are really in jeopardy as we're cutting down on their resources. They can't, uh, they can't bounce back as easy. And uh, okay, so the deer. Here's another example of where, you know, human beings are affecting this whole balance uh, that you get to or that, uh, you know, lasts for a while. And there was a good balance here. I'll use New Jersey in as an example, but the deer are generalists. They're everywhere. And as we are getting rid of the predators in New Jersey, we had wolves. We had lots of coyotes. And uh, we don't have uh, too many wolves left in the wild, if any. And uh, certainly a uh, limited number of coyotes compared to what we've had. But there's a lot of damage that happens because of the deer now. And uh, to the plant life, you know, to the farmers, there's all types of things that the, uh, the deer are really actually interfering with our food source. And, uh, you know, in, in getting rid of the, the predators, uh, we were largely worried about our own livestock, you know, and what the predators would uh, get to. And, yeah, they got to a few, um, but it wasn't as big as, uh, as a deal as we would make it out to. So I don't know, you know, if human beings are ever going to accept wolves back, um, especially uh, in our neighborhoods. But, uh, but yeah, but letting these deer grow has been harmful because of the, the food, as I said, and uh, also because of the Lyme's disease, they carry disease, hitting the cars, damage because of that. They like to live in the fringes of the woods, and we keep bringing the edge of the woods closer and closer as we develop more and more. It's happening all the time. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's a big, big problem. So, you know, uh, we do have hunting seasons for them now, but right now there's no, there, we're not having a lot of success in keeping their population in check. So that's uh, something to think about there too. All right, cutting down the predator-prey relationship. <laughs> of course, we feel for the deer. A lot of times we do, right? For the prey species. Oh, you know, we feel bad for them, uh, perhaps. I don't know. All right, so the lifespans. Um, so here's a survivorship curve, and this is the idea, you know, you're, um, you know, some species are going to die off very quickly once they're born, and, uh, you know, that would be like mosquitoes and things like that. And then there are some that are just dying constantly and some that live longer. So that's the idea of the survivorship uh, uh, scales there. Okay, so a survivorship uh, curve. 
All right, so humans are not exempt from this, uh, right? There's been all kinds of times where the human species has been hit by all this um, uh, business here too, right? Some of their uh, things are density dependent. Um, you know, and if you have a lot of people in one space, disease can spread quickly. It's true for every species, right? And uh, we've had uh, times with this as well where a lot of people have died off. The AIDS epidemic not too long ago. And uh, yeah, we currently went through um, COVID. And I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm just coming out of it. Luckily, I'm okay. But there were a lot of deaths due to, the, um, due to that as well. So eventually, too, you know, there'll only be enough food. There'll only be enough water. So these are other things that, uh, you know, we really want to be I'm going to be thinking about here. We're not exempt. All right, sampling populations. So sampling populations are different ways that we can collect data. It's hard to uh, sometimes to count up every member of a population, including, uh, unfortunately, for some nearly extinct species, it's getting easier because there's so few of them. Um, but uh, generally, it's harder to count up uh, the entire population. So they'd use sampling techniques when they do that. And one of the things that they do is quadrat sampling, as, as you may have done in class. I know we did some of that. And uh, transect lines. I was always calling it quadrant. And uh, as I mentioned before in these videos, my wife, uh, who's a PhD in environmental science and ecology, um, she, uh, she corrected me on that one. <laughs> quadrat sampling. So the idea is quadrat or transect lines. Transect lines are generally like a meter uh, long and they go along a line and you'll pick up on the uh, species that are in that one meter uh, by one meter area going all the way down a line. Uh, you know, you could typically do that in, met she does that in her meadow sampling. Uh, quadrat sampling is more like a grid, oftentimes for counting plants and trees or something like that. You would do a 10 by 10, 10 meter by 10 meter. Uh, sampling area. Mark and uh, recapture sample is another one. So you'll capture a whole, uh, as many of the population as you can, and you'll mark them. And then you'll release them and let them go for a while and then, you know, recapture them. And I guess the idea there is that, you know, you're not going to capture all of the ones that you originally marked, right? Um, and some of the ones that you capture aren't going to be marked. So now that you've done that, you can figure out maybe how big the population is because you'll figure originally, you'll have an idea of what percentage of the population you captured. So that's the idea of the mark and recapture sample. And, oh yeah, all right, here we go. And I think that is going to be about it for the video. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed it, and um, we're going to get on to chapter 8. That's uh, going to be uh, talking more about the human beings and their impact. Uh, but uh, now I'll leave you, and especially since I had to miss some days of school, I will say, as I always do, and it's particularly true this time, I look forward to seeing you back in class. <laughs> All right.